Welcome to Paint Cool Stuff. This is Hardy from Digital Painting Studio, and today we're going to do a really cool project, kind of something really different from what I've been doing lately. It will be a line art cityscape. We're going to do this really cool kind of dreamy, imaginative Victorian city, but it's going to be a lot of fun. We're going to delve into a lot of fundamentals of architectural drawing, a lot of line art rendering techniques, a lot of great stuff to dig into here, and it's just going to be a really cool kind of dreamy finished product. So I think this will be a fun one to follow along with. We're starting off this kind of an illustration with a perspective grid. So I'm setting up a three-point perspective plane here, kind of an X, Y, and Z, so that we can follow these lines. This is so important to giving any kind of an architectural cityscape a really good sense of depth and realism because it's got to follow this grid well or it kind of won't make sense. It'll sort of ring false. So it's worth the time to kind of set up your shot with just these perspective grids. How low you put the horizon, how tight you really constrain those vertical lines, it really dictates how the shot's going to feel. How low of a camera angle you're giving it can really affect how much drama it seems to have. So before we really start sketching, I want to make sure that I really like the vantage point and all of that stuff is going to really work out for us. So I'm just sort of getting started kind of sketching in some very rough general shapes. Starting to think about my concept here. I want it to be kind of a really imaginative kind of almost goofy Victorian city. So we're going to have a lot of recognizable architectural elements, some really cool high-pitched tile roofs, a lot of cool little dormer windows sticking out of the rooftops that I'm already starting to indicate here, and a lot of sort of ornate windows, kind of windows with with woodwork around them, window casings, and, and little decorative elements that just kind of give a little Victorian cityscape all of its charm. So very roughly here I'm just kind of indicating where I want these things to be. And then once we have all those ideas established, all of these kind of pieces we're going to work with, the object here is to just start copying that and just stacking all of these things on top of each other to where it starts to seem like this super crowded kind of Victorian mega city. That's sort of my concept here. I didn't want it to really look like a real place, like you could just go somewhere in Europe, in France or England maybe, and, and just sketch an existing cityscape. I wanted to do something a little bit more imaginative. So one of those great tricks in concept art is if you want something to seem kind of unreal and imaginative, you just sort of push the scale and degree to a really high extreme. So that's what I'm going to do here. I'm going to make it seem like we just have millions of these Victorian type of buildings just stacked up on top of one another. So it's going to be a really fun way to play with scale. I'm going to have this really distant level of depth in my cityscape where we've got kind of an archway. And that's what I'm sketching here. There will be sort of an entire arch, like they, they built this massive bridge and built a whole city within it. So we've got some near structures to observe where we can see the details like these windows and woodwork, cool tile roofs, things like that to give us our, our reference. And then I also want to show just a huge epic scale. So that's what I'm doing way off in the distance here. It's another great trick with architectural rendering and especially when you want to give something a really epic huge quality is you show you show something in the near ground so that we can see all the details all of the things we need to know about it all the visual information about its structure its architectural style all of those things that kind of give us its charm and personality and then we sort of just multiply that a bunch of times kind of make it seem to the nth degree and add things way off in the distance to make it seem like every little stone and woodworking detail that we're looking at up close is multiplied a million times off in the distance. It gives your viewers that really huge, really dramatic sense of scale. So that's what I'm working on here. A 
another kind of a, a fun design element that I want to work in here is that in some cities it seems like there were no building codes or no big master city plan when the city was created. I want this to look like one of those cities where it's sort of like people in a hurry kind of just started mishmashing all of these different buildings on top of each other. So I want to do fun things like windows that don't line up exactly right. Things like roof lines that seem to kind of bump into one another without really looking like they were planned out. All of this cool stuff that makes it all seem really cobbled together and kind of mishmashed. It'll just make the whole thing more interesting and more fun than if we were doing a standard realistic depiction of a Victorian cityscape. Of course, there's nothing wrong with those if you want to attempt something more like that, but I'm trying to do something a little bit outside the box here, kind of a concept art approach to this type of rendering. So if you want to push those uh, creative exercises a little bit, I definitely encourage you to try something like that because these are a ton of fun and lead to a really fun finished product. When doing this kind of a rendering, the main thing we're trying to get our viewer to feel is this sense of wonder and exploration. That's what all of this detail, all of this work really is going towards. We want every little window and staircase and bridge, everything that we can see up close and even way, way off in our farthest point of distance, we want that to make our viewer wonder what's out there. What would it be like to explore this place? That's kind of the whole reason this type of artwork is done for video game or movie concept art. We're trying to just inspire a sense of wonder, kind of an invitation for the viewer to explore this kind of place. So that's what I'm doing here is just with every little window, trying to make it seem like maybe there's a staircase inside of that place where people have to walk up and it lets light in as the stairs go up. Maybe there are different kinds of windows on different buildings because it was a different builder. Things like that. Little staircases, walkways, places to get lost and get into adventures. That's exactly what we're trying to communicate here. And that's what all this detail goes towards. So keep that in mind. A lot of the real work of a line art architectural rendering like this is just in the repetition, especially with something like this where I want to kind of use the same elements over and over again, but kind of take them to higher and higher degrees. There's going to be a lot of repetitiveness. So the main challenge with a line art illustration, especially once we get to the more refined line art later in the process, is just kind of maintaining your patience in resisting the urge to just sort of rush through some things because these do start to get kind of formulaic and even a little bit mundane in the rendering. You, you've got to just try to kind of muscle through that because the, the way that these final products always work best is if it becomes something that every inch of the illustration, if you could just scrutinize every little part for some fun little detail, even down to the far distance, that's what makes it seem really beautiful. It's almost like the viewer can see the work you put into it, and that's where the real beauty and appreciation comes from. So. If you're feeling burned out, if, if your hand is cramping, and mine certainly started getting tired during this sketching process, take breaks. Come back at it with fresh eyes, and, and it'll really seem like a new image again. You won't feel as burned out. So I always recommend that, especially with line art. In a lot of ways, even though it's just a simple sketch, with this amount of detail and refinement that we're going to add, these can actually be more exhausting and labor intensive than even a full painting. So be sure to give yourself a break. Don't really think of this as just a simple sketch. Even though it has that kind of loose, charming quality, even in the finished product, we, we really need to take this kind of seriously because this is a, a very challenging style of project. Never let that line art, charming, sketchy look fool you. These are among the, the more difficult projects that I, I teach. And the reason behind that is that there's just nowhere to hide anything. There's no photo textures. There are no large shadow areas. There's really nowhere to hide a lack of effort. 
every bit of the canvas needs to have a thought out sense of dimension, it has to have the right lines, it has to tell the story that we're going for. All of these things need to be evident in our finished product. So I'd encourage you to take breaks, avoid getting burned out, and just take your time. Treat this one as, as a major long-term project that, that really will take some time and you won't get burned out or surprised by the amount of effort that this will take. So in addition to the Victorian style elements that I'm including, which would be kind of the cool pitched roofs with tiles, the little dormer windows, and all the neat little archways and things, I'm also trying to give this just a tiny bit of maybe steampunk quality. I've got that video game Dishonored in mind. Amazing, beautiful environments. And I'm thinking something about like that, but maybe not quite as dark and and depressing almost. I want to make this a pretty happy overall feeling scene, but that level of kind of steampunk alternate reality type of, of feel here, and I'm doing that with a lot of pipes. Cool little utility things like that to sort of show the inner workings of how this city functions, that can really make it seem real and fully realized in your viewer's mind too. So another little kind of fun, charming detail for our viewer to follow and kind of get lost in. So indicating some pipes going around, there'll be little rain gutter pipes coming down from these rooftops or even these giant kind of utility pipes following these building bases and going across bridges, just fun little things to kind of lead the eye and make this city seem like a more real functioning place. Adding in a round window here just to add a little variety. Really almost no two windows are the same here and that's very deliberate. I want it to seem like this place was kind of just built in a hurry without a master plan. It's all part of that kind of cobbled together charm that we're going for. In terms of tools, I'm using a pretty basic brush for this. Just to sketch, I use this kind of diamond-shaped brush, but the standard round brush would be perfectly adequate for this. It, it really practically doesn't matter at all what kind of brush you sketch with. We're kind of just trying to get a loose idea, set our basic building structures and perspective and guide. We're not worried about line quality at this point at all. We will later when we start doing kind of the inking pass, but for now, not really worried about brushes at all. And I'll talk a little bit more about my inking brush when we get to that step. I'm starting to expand this city upwards. In fact, I'm starting to kind of think I'm going to lengthen my composition a little bit taller. So I want it to seem like even if you, let's say you enter on the street level, you go into one of these doorways or archways, you could find yourself climbing staircases and ending up somewhere high up, like there are these tall towers you could reach. Another one of those great cues to, to give your viewer that invitation to explore. You want them to kind of have a logical path they can follow. Like, okay, I enter this doorway and then maybe I go upstairs and I'd come out over there. Things like that. You want them to be able to sort of visually connect the dots and imagine where they would end up. It's just all part of the fun of this type of image. Part of the thing that really engages your viewer and really gets you that appreciation and, and really makes it fun. I'm trying to remember to scale things correctly. So we've got windows in this closer building, but I'm also adding smaller ones and smaller rooftops and chimneys to this group of buildings that kind of climb higher in the distance. And of course, we've got that whole arched branch of the city way off in the distance, and I want to make sure I don't lose track of scale. So a rooftop, a window, 
recognizable scalable objects need to be the right size depending on how far back into the distance we're trying to push things. It'll really help sell that feeling of, of things being far away, give you that epic sense of scale and distance that we're after. It'll be really cool. In fact, I like how these things are kind of climbing higher so much that I think I'm going to expand things upward a little bit. I really like how you can sort of follow the, the way this city climbs higher and higher. So we'll lengthen things a little bit. The, the foreground archway that we're sort of standing in, according to our camera, is limiting things a little bit. I wanted to do a nice job of kind of framing the top of the composition is this sort of bulky object in the extreme foreground, but I also don't want it to limit us. I don't want it to make it seem like the city is not as tall as it could be. If it's sort of holding back that sense of epic scale that we're going for, then it's a good time to expand. But just food for thought. If, if your composition isn't doing what you wanted to, you can always change that plan later in the process. It's not something you're married to from the beginning. Photoshop lets you change things on the fly, any digital painting app really. So if something isn't working, if it's feeling like you're limiting your idea somehow, just go ahead and change things. Your perspective grid will remain the same and it's just a sketch at this point, so you're really not risking anything. Just make those changes if you want to. Now that we're getting to the inking phase, I am going to expand my image size. So I've made it a good bit larger. And now I'm putting the entire sketch layer to low opacity. I think it's only about 10% here. And now I am using a new brush. It is just oval shaped. That's all, it's just a circle that I squashed slightly and I've got it set to a very tight spacing, just 1%, so there will be no scalloping at all. Every line will be very bold. I've also got smoothing set. This is, um, this is a relatively new feature with recent updates to Photoshop, is the smoothing setting on your brush. I've got it set to 33%. What smoothing does, if you're not familiar, is it just removes all of the wiggle from your lines. It sort of steadies your hand for you. And that can be really useful with line art because we always want those lines to look really confident and smooth. And smoothing can really do that very beautifully for you. It's like it adds 20 years of inking experience instantly. You've got to find the right setting, the one that feels right to you, but 33% seems to be the magic number for me, so give that a try. Now, once I'm in inking mode, we really start thinking about line art fundamentals. And the most important fundamental part of line art that I want you guys to take away is the idea of line hierarchy. Now, what I mean by that is we have thick lines to define our main large shapes. And that's what I'm working on right now. I'm using a relatively bold, thick brush to sort of define the main big structure of this building or this archway. I'm going to use these to sort of define the main big shapes before we get into any kind of detail. So that's what this first pass is really, is I'm just kind of finding all of the big shapes. Now hierarchy, as the name implies, means we'll come back and add lower and lower levels. So as I start to add detail to the interior of these shapes, we're going to use a thinner line. So bold lines for the main shapes and then thinner lines for the smaller details like windows and woodworking details. All of these things that we're going to add in, we'll be doing that with finer lines. Also notice that I'm using Photoshop tools to my advantage. If there are lines that I need to be perfectly parallel, like these little borders on these roof lines, I'm just copying them and making them exactly parallel to their neighbor. It's a great way to make things look perfectly geometrically correct. A little inaccuracies with that can really shoot holes in, in how authentic your image feels. So use those Photoshop tools to your advantage and it can really add a nice authenticity, make it look very crisp and professional looking. So I definitely re recommend that. You can always just use the lasso tool, copy something if it needs to be an identical copy, 
Use the clone stamp tool if you need to make some quick parallel lines. Really makes things very easy. I'm also going to be using layers very much to my advantage here. So once we get the main bold shapes in place, I'll be doing more detailed lines on a different layer. That way if I want to erase away one of these small detail lines, I won't have to worry about losing any of the big shape boulder lines. So things like that, just easy ways to set up your document, can really be doing a huge favor for yourself later on in the process. Along with line art hierarchy, I also want the lines for more distant objects to start getting a little bit thinner too. Even though it's the main big shape, I still want something that's far away to have a less bold outline than something that's close up. So notice this archway in the foreground is a pretty thick line, but we've got these little things like rooftops and archways kind of down that alley that are a lot thinner. And of course, when we get to the big kind of arch building in the sky cityscape in the distance, that is going to be thinner still. So line weight can communicate depth in a really powerful way. So make sure to pay attention to those details. It's line thickness has a huge impact on how successful a line art piece can be. So it's worth putting in that extra time and kind of setting some guides for yourself so that you don't accidentally, you know, spend an hour doing some distant part of your image and realize that the lines are insanely too thick. So starting this big arch city off in the distance, I guess I'll just name it arch city for, for reference, and I'm using a pretty thin line. See, see the huge difference between our extreme foreground and our extreme distance here. The line thickness is, is maybe one-fifth that of the near ground. So little tricks like that already make this seem way far off in the distance. And we're doing all this without any value, any color, any of that other information. Line art can just be that powerful in and of itself. So these little hierarchy and depth tips can really work for you. Now I'm sort of switching to my middle ground, going to start to add some detail here. So I've got a new layer, and I'm just starting to add some fine detail. And I'll use the Photoshop tools to kind of create some geometric shapes so that these little windows and other architectural details are sort of perfectly round and fit with perspective. So adding these little window dividers, I think they're called mullions or something, and I used uh, some selection tools just to create that little radial shape there. Little things like that can really add a lot of solidity and authenticity to your image. If it's something that should be a perfect circle, then just use the Photoshop tools to make it a perfect circle. It really just looks a lot more solid and confident and crisp. All of those great things that you want line art to do for you. But as I continue here, I'm just using a, a relatively thinner brush to start creating some interior detail here. I'm starting to really sort of flesh out all of these little spaces, these archways and windows, all of these little buildings that are kind of mashed together. We're going to start using these slightly thinner lines to describe these secondary shapes so that it all makes sense. We want to start really making this a, a final rendering looking part of our image. Here I'm adding little circumferential lines around things that are meant to be round. So things like these little chimney tops or the rain gutters. I'm just adding those little curved lines. It sort of reinforces the shape. It just adds substance to the, the object itself when it's got sort of a little detail line giving it some accent and describing the shape. So those can be really powerful. Don't overdo though. We never want to over render. In fact, that's sort of a fundamental axiom of line art that I try to stick to is if you don't have to, don't add a line. Line or line art pieces that are just covered up with little tick marks and accent lines, that's when they kind of start to fall apart for me at least in my experience. So, I try to be as economical as possible with my line art. 
use as few lines as possible to communicate the forms, give it just a tiny bit of accent and detail, but after that, just leave it alone. I, I try not to do any kind of cross-hatching or anything like that, because I just like the white spaces to do a lot of the communicating. Remember, our viewer can kind of connect the dots. Another really great way to communicate depth is the idea of layering. So we've got one object that is in front of another. And for this one, it's sort of this closer building is covering up these other buildings that go backwards in the alley. So if we run some of our detail lines right into where that building overlaps, it really helps to enhance the sense of depth. So I'm making sure that a lot of these lines, they don't stop before they kind of run into the object that's covering it up. It has to go all the way there. And that really gives it a sense that it's actually behind the thing that's in front of it. it. Really makes it seem more realistic, gives it that authentic feeling of depth that we're going for. And remember, whenever you need to do a, a group of lines that might overlap another part of your image, just do it on a new layer and you can easily erase away. Really saves you a lot of time and effort. Now that we are getting pretty far along and we've got a lot of our interior shapes rendered, I'm going to start adding some windows. But I'm going to do this in kind of a time-saving way. I'm going to be able to repeat a lot of these. So, what I'm doing now is just doing one window and I'm doing it perfectly flat on so the lines are perfectly horizontal and perfectly vertical and I just copy them and distort them into place and that gives me a lot of mileage out of this. I don't have to worry about creating something with the correct perspective. I can just use shift to constrain my lines to be perfectly vertical or perfectly horizontal and then just make a copy and distort it into place. It's just that simple. So as you can see we go from having nothing to having a lot of very crisp, very well rendered looking windows in practically no time. Now the trick here is to not copy them too much. It can get really easy to start just copying over and over again. So remember not to get too lazy and, and just kind of make a little bit of variety. And that's what I'm trying to do here. I want windows that have square tops and I want windows like this one that have a little bit of a curved arch at the top. It'll really give us that variety that we need to give us that kind of cobbled together type of cityscape that we're looking for. And it just looks cool to have the variety. So we've got different kinds of windows, but they're all very crisp and very well rendered. And we've just used a few quick Photoshop tools to make that easy. In fact, while I'm talking about holding shift, notice that my up and down perspective lines there's actually straight lines only going straight up and down. And that was very much by design. I wanted to be able to hold shift whenever I just wanted to make a line go straight up or down. It's tremendously time saving if I don't have to try and trace a line of a perspective grid perfectly. If I can just render it with shift and just hold that and go straight up or down whenever I want a perfectly vertical line, it makes my time a lot more efficient. I can make all of these nice, crisp, perfectly parallel vertical lines with very little effort. And what we're gonna do at the very end, after we've done all of this careful inking, 
is I'm going to distort the entire image. I'm going to transform it and use the perspective function to kind of add that third perspective point. We're going to sort of pinch things at the top. I'll show you what I mean later, but it's going to add another level of depth and perspective to our image. It's going to be just what we need. But for now, we're just adding as many fun little detailed windows as we can. Again, this is really where your viewer kind of will be charmed by your image when they can go get lost in all of these cool details that you've created. So take your time here. Really make this kind of the special selling point of your image. I'm going to do something pretty complex and decorative here for this circular window. We're just making shapes and I'm going to command click that selection and then give it a uh, delete the inside so that it's just sort of a stroked outline. Looks like we've done lots of careful line art, but all it really is is the Photoshop selection tools that I've used to make these shapes. And then I command click that solid object, contract by two or three pixels, and then delete the middle and suddenly it's an outline. And the same same process as the other windows is I make it perfectly flat on and then I just transform it and distort it into the proper perspective. So I hope that makes sense. It's a great way to, to make something look like you very painstakingly rendered it in perspective, but really you just do it flat and then kind of squash it into the right shape. A lot of times in architecture, we have shapes that are really perfect copies of one another. So let these digital tools help you with that. If something should be kind of an identical clone of its neighbor, like these little wooden slats separating the first and second floors of this building, then go ahead and make them perfect copies. It's kind of one of those mechanical advantages that the digital medium gives you. It makes it easier, first of all, but it's also just what it should be. This is an architectural image where things should be exactly like their neighbor. So those tools can really help you. I can't imagine how, how one would do this with real pen and ink and get those same perfect mechanical results. It must be incredibly challenging, but the digital medium is very forgiving. It gives us all of these great advantages. To do this kind of, kind of image, as long as we just have a little bit of patience, follow a few rules, and it, it always works very well. Along those lines, I'm starting to add some more kind of secondary details to the interior of these buildings. And just like the windows, it's much easier if I make these things flat the first time and then just distort them into position. So I've got kind of a little brick bit of stonework I wanted to use to kind of give some accent to some of these rather flat facades, flat, excuse me, flat facades of these buildings. So I've just sort of done the same technique where I hold down shift to get those perfectly horizontal or vertical lines and then just use distort to put it into the right perspective. Incredibly useful, always gives it a really nice solid professional look and it is way easier than trying to actually make these lines match your perspective grid. Coming back and adding a little bit of accent, just adding a tiny bit more information to some of these emptier places. Little things like brick seams or little cracks in the wall where maybe some of the plaster fell off. Things like that just kind of add some charm and detail and a little bit of backstory to your image. But again, I caution you to be very sparse with these little touches because you want that white space to really be the majority of your image. In fact, I'd say only about 20% of the actual canvas should be covered with black by the time that you're done with these. There should be lots of generous white space in any line drawing. So 
I'm adding some tile details to the roof here and I think they're awesome but it's really easy to get carried away with these and want to just tile in the whole roof. I think it's much better to do what I'm doing here and just add them to a few select places just as little accents. It's just enough information to show us what that material is. You can really imagine that kind of tiley roof texture. It's perfect. It also lets us define our window shapes a little bit more. See I'm doing some little detailed tile line art marks right where the windows come out of the roof. Little things like that help reinforce the shape. They just give it a little bit more accent, but they don't go so far as to start filling in the, the, the white space that we're trying to leave. So use some restraint there. They can be really cool and charming, so it's easy to get carried away. So just be aware of that and use little details like this with, with a good bit of restraint and artistry. The farther off into the distance we go, it seems like there's smaller and smaller details that we need to manage. So first of all, I'm zooming in, but another thing I'm doing is taking another break here because it can start to be sort of tempting to rush through these things that are farther away. They're not in your foreground, so they don't have quite as much of the real estate of the canvas as your other parts, but these are important. In fact, the things that go off into the distance are the things that your viewer tends to sort of fo follow out into the distance. They want to kind of start exploring and it's these little tiny details that start really making this seem charming and, and fun and inviting. So always remember to, to give enough attention to these distant parts and we're going to do that to an even greater extent to this far distant arch city. We're going to really try and put some, some small details in there so that it's just a fun thing to, to let your eyes soar out to the distance and find all of these cool, fun details to explore. Okay, let's add some detail to this far off distant arch city. Now, I'm starting by just roughing in some very large shapes, kind of just creating some rectangles and just little buildings that I can start to kind of define things around. I kind of jump around from roof to archway to doorway, just sort of the same general things over and over again, and windows too, just to sort of start making it seem like it's got some variety, but that it's also kind of just mishmashed together like the rest of our city. We want this to seem like the same kind of thing where this whole arch city was, was built kind of in a hurry without a big master plan and everything is kind of just mashed together. Another thing I'm doing to give this whole thing some dimension is notice that a lot of my lines are kind of getting very compact and very dense around the edges. So at the bottom of the city, we've got all of these overlapping pipes and different little roof type shapes, or I guess floor type shapes, sort of defining that perimeter. That really makes it look like the underside of Arch City is kind of curving away from us. So that's very important. You want those lines to start getting very dense as your scene kind of curves away. It gives you that sense of something that's round and kind of has dimension and depth. But from there we sort of start big defining these larger rectangular building shapes and then I just come back and start to define them and it sort of just takes on a life of its own. You kind of just 
pick a random empty spot and decide, okay, that could be a roof or an archway or a floor. And you just start adding in fun things like chimneys or a pipe or a walkway, little things that you can really make it look like something lived in, something real, a, a living city. And that's all I'm doing here is just starting with big shapes and then coming back to sort of populate them with fun details that make this seem like a real place. And that's exactly the formula for how to make this seem like something fun to explore. So I'm not doing much copying yet, but I will. I'll start using the clone stamp to kind of fill in the emptier spots. But before you get to that point, you should really define the main building shapes and then come back and fill it in. But already we've got a pretty nice realized dense city on this cool little archway. It's got some nice dimension and just enough cool detail to go out and get lost in. And that's exactly what we want. The good news is, is once we get a good bit of this rendered in, you can copy entire chunks of all of this detail and paste it somewhere else. And since a lot of that on the upper side of this arch city is not really gonna be seen, it's covered by our more foreground object, I can get away with just pasting an entire chunk of that. And you can see I'm starting to use the clone stamp to fill in areas. I've done enough actual hand line work here that it won't look rep repetitive if I'm copying parts of this. There's so many different things going on at this point that it's really impossible to notice that pattern. And that's really all we have to do is make sure there are no noticeable patterns and this should all work pretty well. But really loving it and it's so cool how there's such a different line weight and line density between the things we can see close up and this most distant part of our image. That's really what sells that sense of depth is the line weight and the line density. We can only see a few buildings up close, but we might be looking at a hundred buildings way off in the distance here with tiny windows and rooftops, all of those scale cues that really let us know what is close and what is far. That's what gives it that really great epic sense of scale that we're after for a piece like this. Okay, I'll just copy an entire chunk of this to fill in these empty parts of the main outline. And of course, this takes a little fine tuning. It's never going to fit exactly, but want to sort of kind of stitch together the edges of these two parts that I've pasted together. Make sure it works well with the contours. But I think that's working well. These, these far distant parts of our image are really giving it that huge sense of scale and epicness that we're going for. So I've left the foreground for last because it's, it's pretty simple really. It's just a basic column shape with a little bit of detailed stonework, a few steps. I'm trying to just make sure that I, I don't use too many lines here. It's tempting to kind of define every little stone and crack and seam in an archway like this, but I want these lines to, to be mostly white space, maybe little cues of, of some detailing, but that's it. Don't want it to be nearly as dense as the things we have in the distance, or those two things might start to compete. In fact, just in this line art, way it is now we're getting a lot of our cues for that from the white space so you can see the arch city with all of its density way off in the background suddenly it comes to this big white area when it hits the foreground column and that's really a big cue to tell us what is close and what's far so density and thin lines in the distance and low density and thick lines in the foreground if we were to kind of put it all in a nutshell Just a little bit of accent line work here. In fact, I've created my own layer for this. Just if I want to add some little kind of charm lines here and there, little cracks in the sidewalk or little cool little whips of lines just to give a little bit of hand of the artist charm. But again, we want to be very restrained with this. Not too much, but always a cool little accent. Cool, so now that that is done, I have made a copy of everything and I'm doing a perspective transform just to see if I can add a little more depth 
and kind of a, a lower camera to make this seem like the whole thing is taller. And look how powerful that is. Immediately, it looks more like we're sort of looking up at these things that are high up in the sky. And I've gotten away with being able to do perfectly vertical lines for my entire rendering, and I didn't have to worry about following the perspective lines. But suddenly, I get that great three-point perspective look just by saving this step for last. Of course, the only downside is that it leaves a few parts on the edges of your canvas that are empty. So I'm just filling those in, kind of making sure this all makes sense. So I had to sort of copy and paste a few things just to add a little bit of detail. It's kind of a, a band-aid solution, but it really works if you use it with a little bit of finesse. Make sure that all adds up and, and it really won't, won't look bad and, and helps complete the image. Certainly worth it for the, the great effect we get from that perspective distortion that we did. Really adds a lot of dimension, gives it a more cinematic and epic quality. It's always great when you feel like you're low to the ground looking up at this soaring, high, impressive city. Okay, is sort of a final accent to this mainly line art image, I want to add a little bit of tone. Now, I don't want this to become a full painting, but I just want to divide things into layers of depth. And we're going to use the idea of atmospheric perspective to tell us what is close and what is far. We're going to kind of back up all of these great things we've been doing to give our painting depth up to this point. We're going to do that with a little bit of value too. Again, we want the line art to be the main feature of this. I don't want this to start turning into a, a really airbrushy or, or tonal type of image. We're just going to do some basic fills and then we're going to do a tiny bit of rendering, kind of simple light and dark, kind of highlight and shadow, just to give this a tiny bit of rendering and depth and, and it'll look really cool. Kind of a, a concept art presentation to give your line art a little bit more weight and substance really helps you divide what is near and what is far. So it's just a blocking in step where I'm kind of tracing underneath the ink layer on a new layer and once I have a solid line all the way around the perimeter I just use the magic wand tool on the outside and I select inverse and I can just fill it in. Simple as that and it gives us these cool blocked in areas. You can see how much more impressive the feeling of depth is. Now regarding atmospheric perspective whenever I make something lighter in the distance it makes it seem farther away. It makes it seem like there's more air between you and that part of the image. So that's why we have things darker in the foreground and they get progressively lighter in value the farther they go out. So this distant church spire and the arch city we're gonna make that very light. As a final little bit of charm rendering, I'm adding some clouds in the sky and I'm going to do a tiny bit of light and shadow rendering just to give this a, a little bit more polish. It's sort of like I've, I've come this far, it's, it's been a lot of work just to get this very refined, very detailed line art image, so let's kind of give it the, the slickest presentation that we can. You definitely don't have to. I just sort of wanted to show you how to do this for a little bit of extra presentation points on something like this. It can really make it cooler. So I'm just sort of setting up some little tone layers that exist inside of those blocked layers. So painting on top of those and just making things look like they're in shadow when they're in the near ground, sort of setting up a lighting scheme. It's like we're standing in this sort of sh shaded archway looking out at this sunny, beautiful, kind of happy cityscape that soars off into the clouds. So that's, that's really the feeling I want to inspire here is something kind of sunny and happy and just kind of amazing. So uh, I hope that's coming across. That's certainly the goal. But just a little bit of fine tuning to, to make this polished and interesting. And, and give it that great sense of depth and mood that we're after just to tie it all together. I'm using the lasso tools a lot to give me these selections if I want to paint on one plane as opposed to another. So the brick steps for example, they really make it seem like one 
one face of those steps is facing towards you and another is facing up. So simple little plain cuts like that can add so much depth and detail to your image. Working on my middle ground now, I'm just doing a little shadow layer just to make some cast shadows. So on sides of the building that I want facing away from the light source, I'm just putting a little bit of a shadow. It really makes the whole thing look more dimensional and round when we just have these simple light side and dark side type of, of presentations. I'm not trying to, to make it very tonal, so there aren't really any gradients between light and dark especially on these middle ground and more distant objects, I want to keep it pretty flat. I want it to either be shadow or not shadow, highlight or not highlight, with sharp lines in between. So that's what I'm doing here. It's kind of this uh, traditional concept art presentation that we do a lot. It's, it's just this sort of simple, barely tonal line drawing. So I thought that would be a cool thing to share. Now I'm going to add a highlight just to make it seem like the sun is shining on this building so that it doesn't seem too dark now that we've added some value. Now these bright kind of spotlight highlights can have so much information. So notice that I'm having these different rooftops and these dormer windows on the roofs. They sort of cast shadows on one another. It's happening at an angle and in fact the parts of our tallest buildings are already in shadow so it makes you know that there is some taller building blocking out the sunshine in that point. So loads of information can be communicated with these spotlight type highlights of the sun shining on this building below. It's a really cool way to just add a little bit more atmosphere and information and it just makes things seem more realistic and beautiful when these shadows work together. I'm also adding a little bit of detail on the shingles on the roof, these tiles, to make it seem like they sort of bump in and out of the shadow. It just adds a little more texture information as well, but it's all working really nicely. That's doing exactly what I hoped it would do, casting a little bit of light on these near objects, letting us really define our planes, kind of cutting between light and shadow. It just makes things seem incredibly solid and like they're really there. It's a very cool and powerful presentation that just sort of makes all of this beautiful line art that we worked so hard for really polished and well presented. So I hope you'll give it a try. This is sort of the, the fun part of the image. Uh, you have to sort of eat your vegetables first, but then you get to do dessert. And that's sort of what this part is. It's the fun polished parts that really tie it all together. I've even lightened up the line art on my most distant level of depth at Arch City. So just to sort of reinforce that atmospheric perspective, even the lines are not totally black in the background. They're actually a very light color. Now, as a final accent, I found this really awesome old paper texture on Pexels.com. So thanks to the artist who created this, it was free to download. And I've just pasted that in and I'm setting it to over lay layer layer mode overlay mode at 50 percent and it gives us this really cool kind of old notebook rendering type thing i've also added a color burn layer underneath but with that i think we just about have a finished painting i hope you guys like this one really fun a, a great imaginative victorian city that we could just get lost in and explore all of the incredible details great sense of exploration, of space and distance, a, a really fun project that had a nice, happy, sunny atmosphere. So it really checked all the goals that I set for myself. So I hope this has been helpful. For full tutorials on this and tons of other cool subjects, be sure to check out digitalpaintingstudio.com. This video will be part of the Paint Cool Stuff Quick Project Gallery, which will update every month. If there's a topic that you'd really like to see in this series, just let me know in the comments and I'll really try to get to it. So thanks for watching. Until next time, good luck with your artwork.